Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Stefano Stabellini. I'm a fellow at AMD and um, one of the Xen um, maintainers and Linux kernel maintainers. Last year at this conference uh, in 2023, uh, I gave a presentation together with Sentil, who is the safety manager at AMD, um, about a project to um, make Xen uh, the open source hypervisor safety certifiable. So today I'm going to give you an update on what happened since last year on a bunch of areas, uh, including Misra C, requirement, traceability, and more. But before I do that, um, uh, and so there is a link in the slide, by the way, to, to that talk. But um, before I do that, um, I'll give you a brief summary of what I uh, said last year, just to give you enough context to understand the update. Um, so embedded hypervisors are, in a way, they have some similarity with the hypervisor you might be used to in, in data center and, and cloud, but uh, the, the, their purpose is a bit different. The goal is isolation and freedom from interference between multiple domains. Um, so the hypervisor is used to run a critical workload like Zephyr or another Artos and in full isolation from something else, which could be Linux or Android. So mixed criticality, fault tolerance, real time and strong isolation are all, all key properties. Um, and um, so Xen is an embedded open source hypervisor, um, is an open source project under Linux Foundation, uh, very well known and has a very strong review uh, process and security process. Uh, is a reference open source hypervisor for embedded and automotive in a, in a number of open source forums and the industry forums. Um, ARM and x86 has fully supported architectures, RIS-5 and PowerPC ports are in progress. Um, the Xen open source community is, is a diverse multi-vendor community. As you can see on the right, there are a bunch of companies contributing to it. I'm proud to say that AMD grew to be the uh, third, almost the second by just uh, less than 10 commits uh, to, to, uh, to Xen based on the number of commits for the 418 release. Um, Right, I'll, g I'll give you a brief overview of why Xen uh, you know, is, 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 is great for embedded, at least in my opinion. Uh, so especially for the one of you that have heard uh, about Xen many, many years ago, maybe early 2000s, when uh, we were doing mostly servers uh, and desktops. Um, since then, a lot of time has passed. A lot of energy has gone into making Xen a great fit for embedded, and I'm only going to mention a few of these features. Some, new fe some of them are new, some of them are always been there, but they were maybe not exploited to the fullest. Let me start from saying what what's really making everything possible is the fact that Xen has always been a microkernel, as a microkernel architecture, and what that means is. Um, it, it, the, only the hypervisor core need full privileges, and that's quite small. It's um, less than 50,000 lines of code on ARM, and that's with a configuration you can get today without really chopping off big part of the code, which you could do if you have a specialized uh, setup. Um, so large part of the code can run uh, without privileges, at, without any privilege or just a limited amount of privilege over the system which uh, makes it, you know, safety a lot easier um, to achieve. Um, these are a few features that we have, have introduced in the last 10, 15 years now uh, for, I mean, specifically for embedded. One of them is DOM zero-less. You know, typically Xen always relied on a big Linux VM to, um, to, to start first and then start other and manage other VMs. Now that's gone away. I mean, not completely. You can have it if you want to, it's optional. But Xen is capable of booting multiple VMs based on initial configuration, multiple VM in parallel, just at boot time. Because the domain creation now is taken care of directly by Xen itself, DOM0 is not necessary. I mean, you can have it if you want to, but you can have a fully functional system without a DOM0. Uh, which means, you know, you can have static partitioning systems where Xen, once the system is booted, is basically invisible in the sense that it's a tap, you know, the domains, device assignment, you don't really see it any longer unless you want to. Um, other features are um, real-time support with the null scheduler that does static as allocation of virtual CPU to physical CPU without any 
scheduling uh, for best uh, latency. Um, cache isolation in software thanks to cache coloring, so we can detect the relationship between memory addresses, cache lines, and make sure that each VM has always separate cache lines, so that cache interference has been uh, reduced to zero. Uh, we support both uh, Xen PV drivers and Vert.io for device sharing, and especially Vert.io, we support Vert.io with a memory safe uh, way of exchanging memory between VMs. Um, and finally, if all of the above did not convince you that Xen is embedded. Uh, this last point definitely should, because Xen is now running on MMU-less systems. These are microcontrollers that are so small they don't even have an MMU, like Cortex-R52 and Cortex-R82, and Xen is capable of running there. Okay, so uh, Xen at AMD is the open source reference hypervisor for embedded and automotive for both ARM and AMD x86 platforms, and we have a team to uh, develop, enhance, and support Xen for embedded automotive. Uh, as, and, and we have a number of customers across verticals from industrial, medicals, uh, automotive, and more. And many of them require real-time uh, real isolation between VMs. Okay, so this is the last slide, I believe. Yes, it is. On the summary. Uh, so that's the, um, this is the scope and more information about the project that we, it was initially discussed last year. So we are working on making Zen safety certifiable for AMD platforms, both ARM and AMD x86. We are targeting I-66158 SEAL-3, which is the industrial safety standard, as well as ISO 26262 ASL-D, which is the automotive safety standard. ASL-D is the strictest level for automotive. The certification is based on Xen upstream community processes. Now, I cannot stress this enough. Now, uh, it has been, it happened in the past that, you know, people take an open source project and then import it with, within the company, uh, close the doors, and then do everything in private, including, you know, major code changes, you know, uh, review process changes, everything changes, and then they safety certify that. Now, this is not what's going on here. So all the safety certifiability artifacts are all based on upstream activity, upstream review, upstream code bases, upstream everything. A lot of the thing, actually everything I'm gonna talk about in this talk in the sense of Miser C updates requirement is all uh, either already public and upstream or going upstream. Um, however, some of the um, uh, safety artifacts and documentation might be available for AMD customers. All right, so what's the scope? So we are targeting Xen AMD x86 with the uh, newest set of drivers for hypervisor extension, um, IOMMU, HPET, and PCI, similar for ARM, SMMU v3, Geek v3, the Arch Timer, hypervisor extension, PCI. Because Xen has so few drivers only for the core components, we expect it to be easy to port it to future generations. We also have the enabling component for PV drivers and Vert.io for memory uh, sharing and device virtualization between VMs. We have no OS hypervisor dependency. Now, this is very important. You can run as many safe OSs as you like. You can have one Zephyr safe, two Zephyr safe, all the combination that you can imagine. There is no ties between the VMs and the hypervisor, whether the VMs are safe or non-safe. You can come up with the best combination to fit your, um, your use case. Um, we are using DOM0 less for domain creation, so you don't need to have a DOM0. You, you can if you want to, and will support real time. Okay, now, this is the, the, the intro. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the updates and, and what happened in the last year. And I'll give you update, uh, updates in three major areas, uh, which are uh, Misra C compliance, um, requirement and traceability. Let me start from the first one. So Misra C is a set of coding guidelines to write safe C code. Um, and the, the goal is to improve the safety and the quality of the Xen code base. The activity is to look at the Xen guidelines, evaluate them, uh, discuss them with the maintainers, uh, accept them into the Xen coding guidelines, and fixing violations or deviating violations. Deviating means we are saying this is safe even if it doesn't meet MISRA criteria, but we are explaining why it is safe. Um, another important point here is MISRA needs a checker, an automatic way to spot and detect violations, and we are using Baxang Eclair MISRA C checker. 
What about software safety requirements? So these are detailed documentation uh, of the behavior of Zen. And we have uh, worked on defining um, uh, you know, how to structure the requirements that are hierarchical um, and how to trace the requirement. That's the traceability point there, the last update. Okay, let's start with Misra. So initially, together with Baxeng, uh, we uh, selected 133 Misra C rule candidates. We have already discussed 118 of these rules. Uh, 96 have already been adopted into the Xen guidelines, as you can check out on docs.misrc.rules.rsc. That's the document that keeps all the guidelines that we have adopted. There might be a couple missing because they are on the mailing list waiting for the last ARC. Um, 17 um, uh, I, um, of the remaining ones uh, are candidates for mass adoption in the sense that are already clean. We have no violations, but we still need to discuss them to make sure uh, before checking them in. Um, the, there are really only eight rules that are left to be discussed. Um, and so we are really close to the end of that part of the process. In the Xen 418 release, uh, we have 148 commits to fix Miser C violations by Baxang. And um, we went down from the initial uh, count of 2 million violations to 100,000, so 20x improvement from the beginning of the project to now in one year. Um, so at some other numbers, so now we have the Eclair Misra C scanner integrated in the GitLab CI CI loop for upstream Zen to detect regression and violations. We have 69 rules that are checked and with zero violations, so they are clean with seven additional that are clean on in on ARM and four that are clean on in on x86, still work in progress. 35 rules are checked against regression, meaning they're not clean. We have violations, but at least we are spotting if they're getting worse uh, as part of the CI loop. Um, another thing that we have upstreaming Zen, and especially this is useful for other open source projects, uh, is, is they might want to uh, take inspiration from this, we have a pretty sophisticated system to handle deviations. We handle both project-wide deviations. Uh, these are documented in deviation.rst. Uh, and we are also, uh, and we have the Eclair configuration to match also in Zendo Git. And for individual specific violations, we use the SAF tag in, as an encode comment. So basically we add an encode comment, as you see in the picture here with SAF and a number that then corresponds to an explanation. And also we can convert that tag into tool specific tag, like eclair tag, coverity tag, CPP check tag, to make sure that the a Misra C scanner does not flag that as a violation any longer. Um, we, we, you need clean scanner results for the results to be useful. So when you deviate something, it needs to disappear from the list of the violations. Okay. So this is really what I wanted to focus today, not the numbers, uh, but uh, the lesson learned. And after one year and many, many violations fixed, uh, I think we, we, we have a couple of lessons learned to share. And, um, and one of them is, is very, very important to be flexible on and, and being able to adapt the Misra C rules to the project, especially when you start with a mature project with already a rich history and also high quality of the code base like Zen. Um, and, um, and the reason is many of these rules, as you'll see, they are, you know, they, everyone would agree to the spirit of the rule and they really highlight a real problem, uh, but often taken as is, they, they um, trigger way too many violations to, for, for a, a project to be able to handle them but also they go against some of the uh, culture of the project in terms of developer confusion. So one of the important thing about Misra is to address developer confusion in the sense of writing code that is clear. Uh, however, um, you know, what is clear from someone that has experience with Misra and a lot of years working on Misra C project might be not as clear as to someone that has 10 years instead working on Zen. So the developer confusion is a bit dependent on the culture of the project. And I'm going to highlight some of the examples. There are also a couple of additional things that I want to tell you about encapsulating tricks and kconfig and Misra, which are 
interesting. So um, this is an example of uh, a rule that is uh, a bit too restrictive, and that is rule 16.3. That says an unconditional break statement shall terminate every switch close. What does it mean? Every case statement in a switch should have a break. So taking as is, is hard to disagree with it. In fact, is really highlighting severe potential bugs, right? So every, you know, probably all of you have seen bugs where a break was forgot and then you fall through by mistake. That causes like all sorts, aside from malfunctioning, even security issues, it's definitely severe. So you want to be able to take advantage of Misra. You want to take advantage of Misra uh, scanners like Eclair to detect this problem, fix them for you, right? At the same time, you know, taken as is, it has a couple of issues. But first of all, obviously there are cases that explicitly you want to fall through. So you need to deviate those, but those, you know, it's done on purpose that you deviate them, you know, meaning that there is an, it's done on purpose that you need to explain, okay, here I want to deviate, I want to fall through on purpose. For that, we add the fall through keyword that we can add in between so to, to, to clarify the fall through is intentional. So that's not an issue. The real issue is, you know, you, you get to this point, you talk to the maintainer, everyone agrees. But then you look at the implementation and turns out that when they say break in every case, they mean every case. So what if a case finishes with a return? What if the case finishes with a continue or a go to? You still need a break after it. Now, I can see that if you work with this kind of code style all your life, you see return break come natural to you. Me, that I work almost 20 years in Zen, I see a return and a break and I think, wait a second, was there a Nash define taking the return away? Is there some self-modifying code that is kind of editing the return like assembly somewhere else, changing it? I start you know, having conspiracy theories in my head when I see something like this. So, um, so what we did is um, we deviated continue, go to, and return because you know, they, you know, they are intentional, but still accepted the rule so that we can still use Eclair uh, you know, to scan for these bugs. And this is where one of the key, maybe the most important takeaway from this talk is you need a MISRC scanner that is flexible. You need to be able to do something like this and the MISRC scanner to follow you. So you need the MISRC scanner able to deviate, as an example, continue, go to, and return. I have another, another point is about clever tricks. Like we all have clever, clever tricks in, in the code. You see an example here on the top uh, where you have, you know, that trick um, extract the uh, least significant non-zero bit. Okay. It works, I, you know, trust me. Um, so the point is, you have it in the code, though, what do we do? Just move it in a macro, move it in a static inline, then you deviate the macro static inline. That alone is explaining that, that you know, what the, what the macro or static inline does is valuable. And then in time, if you want to, you can change the implementation to something that is more uh, MISRA C compliant. I have another very interesting example, and I think this is one to, under, to, 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 to kind of follow through our mental process uh, that I think will help you uh, if you have your own project and you want to do MISRA C. So rule 10.1 says, Operands shall not be of an inappropriate essential type. Now, I understand you don't understand if you don't know Win Misra, but I'll, I'll give you, it's too long to explain, but the, basically Misra uh, prohibits certain operands and operations combinations. As an example, it, pro it prohibits arithmetic operation of integer and float, or integer and Boolean, or enum and characters, for good reason, right? So 10.1 is an important rule, cannot really be easily be dismissed, like overly complicated. It is real. It, it highlights undefined behavior in C, unspecified behavior, implementation specific behavior. There are real problems here. Again, you want the Mira C scanner to tell you this is a problem. However, you enable 10.1 on Zen and there are 269,393 violations on x86 and 65,731 on ARM, how do you go about it? So first, you look at the details, and there are certain operands and operation combinations that are, that are guaranteed to be safe by modern version of the C standard. Then, 
given the assumption that Xen makes about ARM and x86 architecture supported uh, or C compiler supported, there is a bunch of other operands and operation combinations that are also guaranteed to be safe. Finally, certain combinations are marked, I mean, that, you know, um, prohibited by this rule because of developer confusion. But like we said, some of them, they don't confuse Zen developers, such as uh, implicit Boolean conversion. This is when you do if with a pointer to check that the pointer is not null. Right? Everyone, I, I mean, I've done it for many years, doesn't confuse me, but Misra doesn't prohibit, does prohibit this kind of behavior. So, bottom line, after we uh, deviated all of the above, we went down from 335,000 335, approximate to only 95. And these 95 remaining are probably genuine issues that need to be addressed, and we'll work through them to get full compliance. So, uh, and you still get the benefit of using the scanners to check for the real issues that, you know, those are still, you know, checked and not deviated, right? Um, um, so that's an example of how to deal with a particularly difficult rule, but important. All right, I, one more thing I want to tell you about is um, uh, kconfig. So in modern open source project, uh, we uh, all use kconfig a lot in Xen, in Zephyr, in Linux. Why? Because we target ma very many different configuration use cases, um, and it's natural to use kconfig for that. Now, when you come to Misra, as we are adopting Misra, I mean, this is a, is, is a process, right? We are not going to go from zero to Misra for everything, and certain options don't make sense for safety or don't make sense for embedded. So you want, at the beginning, to take them out. You want to reduce the scope to do Misra, done well for the subset that is relevant for safety. And then one day, maybe you do it for everything, but you need to start from somewhere. So how do you take this out? You use kconfig and you disable the option, right? And that's where the problem lies. So traditionally, we have used uh, all, you know, preprocessors, uh, like in the left, to take something out, like config foo, you take it out and then you disable the code. However, exactly for example, like the one in the picture, it's always been a bit confusing. Preprocessor doesn't mix too well with C code. So all, you know, many projects, including Xen, Linux, and others, are moving toward the right, right? Is enable is a little trick. What it does, it becomes if zero, if the kconfig option is disabled. So from Xen point of view, left and right are the same. And write is preferred because it's easier to read, it flows better in C code, it's easier to review, and so on. So why? Because if zero is automatically disabled and removed from the compilation by the compiler. That is not what Misra thinks. So from Misra point of view, only things that are removed from the preprocessor are actually removed. Now, this is another um, opportunity, for, opportunity for deviation. So if you check that with the compiler that you allow, actually the code is indeed removed, if not by the preprocessor, by later stages of the compilation pipeline, then you can deviate this and, uh, and claim equivalence. And that is what we've done in Xen project. Okay, for the people that were not interested in Misra but interested in other things, this is the time to pay attention. So uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, talk about requirement for a bit now. Um, so um, we have not upstream any requirement yet, but we have written about 300 and uh, we are about to start upstreaming them. And I'm gonna talk to you about what we have done, uh, what we intend to, uh, uh, how we intend to upstream it, uh, and some of the key information about requirement for safety and open source projects. So first of all, what are the requirements? Requirements are a detailed description of all the software behavior. So you need to describe everything that the software is supposed to do if you ne then need to test it, right? I mean, if you don't know what the software is supposed to do, how can you test it? I mean, you can test it, but then you don't know what the outcome, if it's supposed to be a success or a failure, right? So you need to describe everything so that everything then can be tested, right? So the requirements are this description of everything. When I mean everything, I literally mean everything, like all the features, but also all the behavior in terms of error handling, uh, faults, really anything. So the, what we did is we split the requirement on three levels. 
uh, the requirements are typically hierarchical and are, are the same. So we uh, divided them up in three levels, market requirements, product requirements, and software safety requirements. Market requirements are the highest level. For each market requirement, there are multiple product requirements that go more into details. They start to be exam specific, but they are still high level. And for each product requirement, there are many software safety requirements that go even more into detail. That's the most fine granular level. And this goes into really all the nitty de uh, gritty details about uh, our driver is written. Here in the slide, you see M to N instead of one to N because sometimes one product requirement can link to more than one market requirement. So to be precise, I wrote M to N, but conceptually you can think of this to one to N and from product requirement to software safety requirement, again, one to N, also is not exactly always the case. Um, so this is an example of a market requirement. So uh, I'll let you read it on the slide. Uh, these are three real, in fact, market requirements th uh, that we wrote. So some key points here. So they, I, the, the main goal of the market requirement is to identify the scope of the safety certification project. What is in the scope, what is out of the scope, and the expectation from the point of view of the customer in terms of features that they need or uh, use case. So it's written with a very high level view of the system. So in this case, there is a requirement to sta statically create VMs or being able to assign devices to VMs. This is the very high level um, way the market requirements are written. Like I said, from each market requirement, uh, there are multiple product requirements. So product requirements, uh, like they start to be um, exam specific. Um, and as you can see on the right, uh, um, they start to be a bit more finer granular. So it's not just you need to start VMs. Is uh, you know you need to start VMs that have an emulated UART. They have a way to uh, do I/O, internal console I/O. They need to um, uh, they need to have an emulated timer or a sort of a timer. You know you go more into details about what the environment is actually supposed to look like, and they also start to make Xen specific assumptions like, such as Xen shell provides this, Xen shell provide that. Um, uh, they are still written with a high level like a high level view, so you wouldn't be able to test one of these product requirements directly. Like the, there are very many ways in, in which you can provide an emulated timer, as an example, very many details that could change. That is, you know, the most interesting one, to be honest, as an engineer at least, they, they are the software safety requirements, because those are the ones that really describe the whole lot. They need to be individually testable. So there needs to be clear and unambiguous so that an engineer just looking at the software safety requirement together with the help maybe of the architecture document that describes the whole architecture and give you a bit more of an overview, an engineer needs to be able to write a test. A test without looking at the implementation in Xen at all, right? Just looking at the software safety requirement and maybe a couple of additional docs. So they need to be super fine granular. And here there are some examples, right? They, they talk about how the timer can be probed in device tree, how the probing looks like. They talk about the clock, you know, the counter frequency, how it can be detected. They talk about how you can access the register of the timer, which register are available, uh, what, what is, you know, the MMIO space of the device, how to trigger interrupt both physical and virtually interrupt, basically all the details of the um, feature. So yeah, so the, the here are all the key, uh, key um, features of software safety requirements. So written in English from the perspective of what Zen is supposed to provide. So they need to be uh, independently testable. They're in the most granular form. Uh, you should be able to write a test just looking at them uh, and um, unambiguous and Traceable, which is the next topic I have for you. So um, now your market requirement needs to link to product requirement, which needs to link to the software safety requirements, which needs to link to the test all the way to the result. 
all this graph of linking needs to be done somehow. So as we are you know, upstreaming, about to upstream the uh, requirement to Xen, how do we go about it? So traditionally, requirements were stored, handled, reviewed, and versioned in complex proprietary solutions such as JAMA. Um, and this tool will give account, account permissions, version on the document, um, right or lack of rights to change the documents and do review comments, all of that within this tool. Now, as you can imagine, this does not go very well with an open source community. Why? First of all, you need a way to give everyone accounts. Second of all, uh, these documents were you know, meant to be written in Microsoft Words or PDF format, which the community has not been traditionally very good with. So instead, what, you know, what we are doing, uh, we are writing um, requirement as RST and Markdown docs. So there are already uh, a trend in open source projects to write documentation as Markdown or RST. Now, as you can see, like everyone on GitHub is writing, you know, a readme that gets automatically rendered by the GitHub UI, right? So everyone is familiar with this process. Sphinx is used very commonly to generate PDFs from RST files. The device switch pack itself, I think, is written in RST, if I remember right. The point is, is widespread in open source. Why, why do we like it? We like it because you can write this documentation exactly with the same tool you write code, like Vim. You can review this document, this document using the same review tools, like either email, GitHub, whatever you use, and you use the same versioning system that you use for uh, the code for these documents. So it fit extremely well into the community processes. Everyone is already familiar with them. They can be productive immediately, right? So, I, so this is why we adopted um, writing requirement as RST files. Uh, or, the code that, or I easily have been marked down, but we picked RST. They're very similar anyway. Um, so if you write requirement as RST, what is the gap? You know, I mean, the review, you can do it on mailing list or uh, GitHub as a code. Do you have a versioning system with Git? What, what's missing? The missing piece is traceability. How do you do all the linking and how do you prove to the assessor that the links are all complete all the way to the test? The linking part is a missing feature because if it wasn't for the linking, you wouldn't need anything except for your Vim and RST and RST to OHTML or RST to PDF, right? You will be sorted. So thankfully, um, there are a number of open source projects that stepped up to solve that problem. And the, one of them, the one we picked is Open Fast Trace, Trace but there are many others, including Strict Doc and Bazel, and there is a Bazel talk today, which I encourage you to go and attend. My point is all of these projects will solve the issue for you. And I'm gonna talk to you about Open Fast Trace specifically, but uh, any of these are great solution for your project. Um, so Open Fast Trace uh, is a project that handles traceability in markdown file, RST support is actually in progress. Um, it handles this linking between requirement and also all the way to the code. It detects missing link or obsolete links um, and it generates the report in HTML. So how does it work? So one, one interesting feature of Open Fast Trace is that it basically supports requirement written, yes, markdown on RST, but basically in free form. It doesn't mandate a specific format for your requirement. So you can write, you know, whatever, you know, in whatever format that you like, you just need to embed a tag. So the tag over here at the, at the top is the, is the tag that identify that requirement and its version. And needs is the dependency toward the more finer granular requirement. Going in here, this is the uh, more finer granular requirement that satisfies the dependency and as you can see as its own tag. And a special keyword covers to link back to the uh, previous higher, uh, higher level requirements. With this tagging system, that's all fa open fast trade needs to detect the linking and solve the traceability issue, all the way to the code. So you can embed these tags also in code itself as in code comments. 
And the top one you can see is the tag to say this is an implementation of a test for a requirement, right? It says input, the stands for the implementation. On the way to the right, it says test. This is implemented the test for the requirement. And the one at the bottom is the script that runs the test. So that is the actual test running. You are expected to get the result out of that. That's it. So it's extremely simple. And at the end, it generates something like this for you. So this is a web page with a bunch of links. Uh, they are hierarchical, hierarchical, and you can see when the links are met, all the dependencies are satisfied. There is a green check. And when there is something missing, there is a X, red, red X, a red cross, to say, you, you know. Um, so if you update one requirement, you are expected to update the, the version on the tag that you see, like for instance, here, that's the version of the tag. And if you change the version of the tag, then uh, open fast trace can detect if you haven't changed previous versions. So, so if there is some obsolete links in the pipeline. Um, so this is an example when you click on expand and you see more details about the linking and whether any of them is missing. That's it. Uh, so uh, conclusion, uh, Xen is an open source project under Linux Foundation. We have a, a healthy and diverse community. And this is one of the top contributors. Uh, Xen is a great embedded hypervisor. Uh, and we have a project to make Xen safety certifiable for AMD platforms. Um, we are doing uh, a couple of things that are interesting that we're doing right now are MISRA C and requirements. For MISRA C, one of the key conclusions is the configurabil configurability of the MISRA C scanner, a clear in our case, is absolutely essential. You need to be able to adapt the MISRA C rule to your project in the best way to take the most advantage of MISRA. And for that, you need a very adaptable and configurable and flexible MISRA C scanner. Second uh, key conclusion for you is you definitely need the MISRA C scanner integrated in the GitLab CI or CI loop that you have as soon as possible to help uh, ease the burned burden on the maintainers uh, and also reap the benefit of MISRA. Um, the, uh, the higher quality the code, the more deviations are expected, but still MISRA uh, offer potential for suggestion and help in spotting and uh, spotting severe, potentially severe problems. For requirements, instead, my conclusion is use requirement as code. Use Markdown, use RST, write plain text documents, and use one of the fantastic open, to, open source tools out there to handle traceability for you, such as TrickTalk, Basil, or Open Fast Traced, as we did. And the upstreaming of the requirement will be coming soon. That is the end of my talk, so uh, I'll take questions now. I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Stefano. Um, it was really great presentation and interesting. I have a um, couple of questions. So the first one is about Mistra. Now, if I remember correctly, um, you say at the beginning that um, Zen is a, um, as a microkernel architecture and it is relatively small, like 50,000 line of code. And now I see that, uh, I mean, and uh, I mean, I fully agree about, you know, like it is impossible to have full MISRA compliance. You need to, you know, you need to assess the different rules and pick up those that, you know, would apply and maybe, you know, uh, justify why those that do not apply um, actually are, are okay to be waived. Um, however, if I remember your presentation, you say that you still have 65,000 outstanding violation. Yeah, something, something so like that. Yeah. It sounds more, I mean, that you have like more violation than line of code. This is because, um, so first of all, the 50,000 line count is for ARM. There is uh -huh. also x86, which is bigger. Uh, but also keep in mind that um, when the violation counts, and this is how, then you, you could ask the same question for the initial number, there was 2 million. <laughs> how do you get 2 million? That is because, first of all, you can have multiple violations on the same line. But more than that, if you have a violation on a macro, like test bit, test and set, the violations are reported not at the macro definition, but at the macro invitation. So every time you call, you know, set yeah. bit, test bit, 
they trigger a violation. So okay. instead of having one for test bit, you have one million, okay. right? Um, so uh, I think it's more, so this is why the absolute number doesn't tell you that much. So in my original version of the slide, and maybe that's the one is online, I made a change just this morning to give you both the before and after number, because it's the relative number that is more interesting. What's interesting went from 2 million to 100,000, right? right. The, what is exactly 2 million or what is exactly 100,000, you need to really look into the details to understand, uh, right? Because if you have uh, out of the 100,000, 100, you have 90,000 test bits, mm -hmm. which we do, by the way. Test yeah. bit is one of the outstanding ones. It, you see what I mean? This is why we are close to comp completion, even so we are 100,000. Right. Okay, so uh, yeah, my, actually my question was more like, I, I was wondering basically if you know, rather than uh, looking at, you know, each Mr. C rule, you know, one by one, maybe if, you know, uh, maybe you already tried, I don't know, right? but if you would look at table six of ISO 26262 that, you know, specify the, you know, the coding and design principles, right? And maybe starting from there, you know, you could, you know, find a subset that is more also um, you know, that fit better also with the uh, open source development process that is already in place. Because, I mean, I don't know, but my, I, I'm wondering if, like, even if we were able to fix all this violation today, would, I mean, would all the rules that it, we impose be compatible with the current development uh, process of Zen? I, I don't know. So, 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 so first of all, yeah, you, you raised a good point and we did that analysis and, and we, we came to the conclusion that the Mr. C was the best, and, but let me explain why. So first of all, one, disambiguation. ISO 26262 does not require Mr. C. Mm. Like, yeah. So it only requires good coding guidelines. So you could pick any set, including your own, and demonstrate this is a good coding guideline. But if you look at all the possible safe coding guidelines for C that there are out there, not only Misra C is the most detailed, more, also most flexible, but it's the one also with more mature tooling. So good luck getting something like Bug and Claire on your own set of guidelines or third C even, right? So po the point is Misra C uh, had the most mature ecosystem, the most well thought through rules, and, um, and also one of the things that we liked about Mr. C is they never compromised the quality of the code for compliance of the rule. So um, now to answer your second part about um, is it compatible? So th this is why it's very important to add the Mr. C scanner as part of the CI loop. So if you add more violations, they immediately get detected and, um, and, and, trig and, and you know, so then, then the contributor or the maintainer can address the violation and fix them. The process of going rule by one by one is extremely important because you cannot really take them wholesale because nobody will really learn. The, the, the looking at the rule one by one is also so that people learn them, you know, get the buy-in from the people and make sure that everyone is aligned behind supporting a rule and why, right? Um, and time will tell. So the, uh, we are still just at the, uh, at the end of the project now. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll right. see. Uh, okay. Let's have a conversation in one year and I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and I also had uh, another question that was about, I mean, you mentioned traceability from requirement uh, to, to go to, to testing. Uh, you didn't mention about uh, any software architectural design that for ASLD, for example, has a very strict, you know, rules. I mean, you need to apply semi-formal methods and also the verification of the design, you know, is, uh, is quite strict. So, but do you have any activity in place? We are in that working regard? on the, uh, we are definitely working on an arch architecture document uh, and indeed is not easy. So, uh, but I, I, we made, and we made progress. We wrote a few chapters, but I didn't have enough information really to, to, to share in a talk. Um, okay. But yeah, that has activity has started. Thanks. Uh, what does it take for a new customer to take upstream Zen into production? Well, 
So in, into production, you, you, you could take it straight away. I guess you're asking into production with safety certification. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for safety, uh, there is quite still a bit. Like, if, you know, even, um, even if you include all of the things that were not made public yet, uh, we're still kind of maybe halfway through the process, right? So, uh, but the current status of upstream Zen is Misra is almost there, and the requirements are about to start. So, you know, that to give you, we do have some testing infrastructure in place already, like we have the GitLab CI testing infrastructure uh, that to, to trigger a variety of tests from Linux to uh, unit, I mean, more, more smaller tests. Um, so that is in place, but we don't have enough for sure tests to cover what uh, safety requires. So there is still some gap, uh, but yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm not familiar with ISO 26262, but do you guys have any needs for test grading or that's what they call it in AEH land, but uh, maybe like MCDC coverage? So MDC, yeah, that's the O178C. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, uh, so we had people asking for the O178C and we can have a conversation after the, okay. uh, after the presentation. Um, MD, uh, that's not one of the things that we're planning to do. So uh, ISO 26262 maybe recommends it, that does not, uh, well, I should say. What well, do you even do statements? IA6 is 1508 at least. Yeah. Recommends it, does not require it. So we're not planning to do it. Okay. Uh, we plan to do coverage. Like just statement uh, coverage or decision right. coverage. Okay. Yes. So the safety uh, certification has to be happened only for like DOM zero or if you are running a DOM U, how do you? That's a good question. So um, the reason why we really did DOM zero less is so that you don't have to have a safety certified DOM zero, but you can if you want to. So if you have your safety certified Artos, uh, you want to do some monitoring over the other VMs, for instance, good idea. You can do a DOM zero privilege monitoring anything safe, safe VM. Like, that is okay. But thanks to the DOM zero less architecture, the idea is you don't have to have one. So if a customer wants, for instance, to have only like non safe VM and maybe an A's or B lower level of safety Artos, we would allow that. And we will, uh, you know, enforce isolation and freedom from interference for, for all VMs. Um, yeah. So do, the DOM use don't have to be safety certified, uh, but one that is safe, you could, you know, make it DOM zero if you want to, optionally, or even a partial DOM zero. Like you, you could give some of the privilege rather than all. Yeah. So does that apply to all the like cache coloring features, all the stuff? Yeah. Okay. So if you had a DOM zero and you wanted to restrict it, doesn't that mean you need the security module in Zen? Is that part of what you're going to certify? So, so there are two things that we're looking at. So one is there is already a Zen security module, short for XSM, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to specify extremely fine-grained permissions. So that's one option. What we're also looking into is whether we can, uh, I have uh, a very simple, very simple check like a trivial check to say, well, these, let's call it DOM zeros, not really DOM zero anymore. You can have some special operations, but only towards non-safe VMs. Oh, okay. Right? Uh, you could specify that in XSM, but XSM is like SC Linux. Right, but for is better XSM or worse. going to be part of the code base that gets audited for safety? So we are still have to make the decision whether to do XSM or the simplest, the simpler mm -hmm. version, you know, let one VM to do things to non-save VMs or not to save VMs, but one of the two will be in, yeah. So my real question was about ASLD. So you talked about it, uh, targeting ASLD. Is that on lockstep processors or you think you could do it without so lockstep? The safety, the safety certifiability for Xen is as a safety element out of context, okay. which means we don't really say what the hardware is going to look like except for basic assumptions. But yeah, typically the hardware is in lockstep, right? Okay. But yeah, okay. we will not uh, say one way or the other. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
thank you much for, for all the questions, and I'll be available after the talk if you have more, and thanks for attending. <laughs>